The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Taking Direction from Biomarkers and Prognostic Factors in CLL. Interprofessional Strategies for Addressing Challenges with Continuous BTKI Therapy. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash UTY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Taking Direction from Biomarkers and Prognostic Factors in CLL. Interprofessional Strategies for Addressing Challenges with Continuous BTK Inhibitor Therapy. I'm Dr. Jennifer Wyack from The Ohio State University. Today we're going to explore how we compare the most current evidence we have with the BTK inhibitor agents in CLL with a modern understanding of prognostic factors and resistance mutations to plan for sequential therapy. During this discussion, I will share important resources that can be used to help you make accurate prognostication in CLL, but also to help convey this information to your patient. You'll want to refer to these practice aids throughout, so please take a moment to download these tools before we get started. Let's begin. So just as a background, a reminder about the current status of BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors in CLL. Uh, we do have three currently FDA-approved inhibitors in CLL for BTK, and these are ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib. We have two non-covalent BTK inhibitors that are not approved in CLL yet, pirtobrutinib and nemtobrutinib, though pirtobrutinib is FDA-approved for mantle cell lymphoma. We also have the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax FDA-approved for CLL. Now, one really important thing that we need to consider when taking care of our CLL patients is to perform prognostic studies prior to starting therapy. Um, there is quite a bit of real-world evidence that suggests that most CLL patients actually do not have all their prognostic factors done before therapy is considered. Um, earlier evidence from the INFORM CLL registry suggested that only about 11% of patients had IGHV mutational status done. 11% had TP53 mutation status, and a little bit more about almost a third of patients had FISH testing done. The importance of this is that many patients then who have high-risk features such as TP53 alterations, either 17P deletion or TP53 mutation, don't receive NCCN recommended regimens for their CLM. So those patients should not be considered for chemotherapy and really in most cases should receive a BTK inhibitor. Um, and so, you know, always think about this when you're starting your patients on CLL therapy or even a diagnosis, get these prognostic studies done. Another thing I just want to point out by way of background is that even though we have great therapies for CLL with the BTK inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitors, especially patients who have high risk disease are at risk for progression on both of these agents. And patients with that so-called double refractory CLL or CLL that is refractory to both BTK and BCL2 inhibitors have a very poor prognosis. And actually, um, after BTK and BCL2 inhibitor therapy, the median time to discontinuation of the next line of therapy or death is only five and a half months. So this is really a special patient population that we need to be mindful of. So our goals for today First is to enhance understanding of the mechanistic selectivity and safety differences among the covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors. I'll try to bring you up to date on current techniques, including next generation sequencing, that can be done for these therapeutically relevant markers like TP53, and we'll also discuss BTK mutation. We'll try to augment your ability to develop sequential therapy plans for patients with CLL um, with a special focus on those who are progressing on or intolerant to covalent BTK inhibitors. And finally, we want to help you educate your patients on their prognosis, facilitate clinical trial enrollment, and address dosing and safety considerations when using BTK inhibitor strategies. I'd like to say a special thank you to our partner, the CLL Society, who helped us put together um, this um, presentation for you today.
And the Seal Law Society, if you're not familiar with, has a lot of resources, um, mostly aimed towards patients and caregivers. Um, this is a, a list of many of the services that they provide. I want to uh, point you toward this Test Before Treat Biomarker Education Program, which we'll mention a little bit more later, um, which talks about some of these important prognostic studies prior to treatment. So let's start with our first section, optimizing continuous covalent BTK inhibitor therapy. We'll talk about comorbidities, prognostic factors, and resistance. So one thing I also want to point out is that it really takes a team to manage patients with CLL who are undergoing therapy. In addition to hematologists, oncologists, we have oncology nurses who are um, often very important in education as well as management of adverse events. We have our pharmacists who also help a lot with AE management, as well as drug interaction and some care coordination. We work very closely with um, pathologists in terms of some of these molecular testing that we perform. And then in many cases, other subspecialties to deal with some of the complications of our therapies, including cardio-oncologists for some of the cardiac complications of BTK inhibitor therapy. So this is uh, just a breakdown of the NCCN guidelines for frontline and subsequent therapy for patients with CLL and SLL who don't have TP53 alterations, though the TP53 guidelines look fairly similar. And we can see that in the preferred agents, we have two BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. And acalabrutinib, of course, can be given with or without abinutuzumab. And then we have the BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax, which is also given in combination with obinutuzumab. Um, in the other recommended regimens now, we have the first-in-class BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib, either given alone or in combination with either a CD20 antibody or venetoclax. Um, the reason that ibrutinib was moved to an other recommended regimen is based on safety data, which we'll talk a little bit about today. When we think about second line and subsequent therapy, really it has to do with what the patient was treated with in their frontline therapy. But really any of the drugs that we use for frontline therapy can also be considered for second line therapy, often um, using these in, in really either sequence is appropriate. So CLL, as you know, is a very heterogeneous disease. And luckily we have a number of prognostic factors that are extremely important, both in understanding a prognosis for an individual patient but also really helping to, to pick the best therapy. So these prognostic studies can be done at baseline, um, but at least should be done prior to starting treatment. The ones I wanna highlight here are two methods of looking for uh, structural abnormalities in CLL, meaning chromosomal abnormalities, and then um, two sequencing techniques, looking at uh, mutations and uh, IGVH sequencing. So. The first of these is FISH testing, which is using interface cytogenetics, using antibodies to look for specific chromosomal abnormalities. Here we're focused on deletion 13Q, trisomy 12, 11Q deletion, and 17P deletion. As you know, 17P deletion results in loss of the TP53 gene and is currently our most high-risk group of CLL patients. Um, in addition to FISH testing, it also can be very helpful to perform CPG-stimulated metaphase karyotype analysis. And that's because we know that FISH testing, you can only find what you're looking for there. Um, however, we know that patients who have a complex karyotype, which is three or more chromosomal abnormalities, also have high-risk disease. And so it's helpful to identify both karyotypic complexity as well as the presence of individual high-risk chromosomal abnormalities. So in addition to uh, FISH testing and karyotype, it is also really important to perform TP53 DNA sequencing. And that's because TP53 can be mutated in the absence of a 17P deletion. And we know that mutated TP53 as well is a very high-risk abnormality in CLL. So in addition to these specific gene and chromosomal changes, it's also helpful to check the IGHV mutational status. So this is looking at the mutational status of the variable region of the immunoglobulin heavy chain. And we know that patients who have um, less than 2% divergence from the germline sequence, which is um, indicative of IGHV unmutated status, have an 
more unfavorable prognosis. Those that have higher rates of mutation, suggesting a more mature type of CLL cell that's undergone somatic hypermutation prior to becoming a cancer cell, those patients tend to have more favorable prognosis. All of these tests are extremely helpful prior to starting your treatment. So as mentioned, the FISH testing for the chromosome abnormalities in CLL is really important. This is the donor paper from back in 2000, which was the first time it was identified that some of these prognostic um, cytogenetic features, especially 17P deletion, did lead to higher risk disease in patients. It also is really important, like I mentioned, to both do FISH testing for deletion 17P, but also do mutational testing for TP53 by next generation sequencing. The reason this is important is about 80% of the time these two abnormalities do coexist. So one TP53 allele is deleted with the 17P deletion and the other TP53 allele is mutated. However, there is a small group of patients um, usually this is about 10% of patients at, at the time of frontline treatment that will have a mutation but don't have the FISH abnormality. And this is really important. Many times these are a low allelic burden of the mutation, um, but they are still associated with high-risk disease, and these patients still should be considered for therapies like BTK inhibitors that work better in patients with TP53 alteration. So as you know, Deletion 17P, TP53, highest risk for CLL patients. And, and these patients really have done uh, fairly poorly using historical treatments. Um, so these patients don't tend to respond to chemotherapy, or if they do, they respond for very short periods of time. So really, BTK inhibitor therapy has been the first major breakthrough for these patients. Here you're seeing a pooled analysis of a number of frontline CLL trials looking specifically at those patients who had TP53 abnormalities, so either 17P deletion or a TP53 mutation. And you can see that four-year progression-free survival is still 79%, which is really phenomenal for this group of patients. And really excitingly, this is just two examples, but this has been seen in pretty much every frontline therapy using um, ibrutinib at least, the other um, BTK inhibitors just don't have quite as much, as robust long-term data with them. But here is the Illuminate study and the Alliance AO41202 study, where we see that patients treated with ibrutinib do the same whether or not they have an abnormality in TP53. Again, this is the only therapy that we know of that that uh, shows this type of efficacy in patients with this high-risk abnormality. In contrast, actually, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, while also an excellent frontline therapy for CLL, you can see here that those patients who have TB53 alterations, that's the solid line, don't do as well as those patients who don't have those abnormalities. So really, when you're thinking about your frontline treatment for CLL patients with TB53 abnormalities, for most patients, a BDK inhibitor is going to be your best choice. So I mentioned that um, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib have a little bit less robust data in this setting based solely on the fact that they um, haven't been around as long. Um, what we're seeing, though, in terms of frontline data with small numbers of patients, relatively short follow-up, it looks like those are going to be the same as ibrutinib, where patients with or without TP53 abnormalities are going to do just the same. Um, so here is the NCCN guidelines for patients with abnormalities in TP53. So either 17P deletion or TP53 mutation. You can see they look basically the same as for those patients um, without TP53 abnormalities, at least in the frontline setting. For second-line therapy, you also have the addition of venetoclax just given by itself. Um, so again, just to mention the CLO Society's Test Before Treat programs, this is a, a program aimed towards patient education, um, uh, trying to encourage patients to advocate for themselves in terms of getting these prognostic testing done. Um, so in addition to doing all of these tests prior to starting treatment, 
patients who patients should have fish testing, cytogenetics, and TP53 mutation done prior to every line of therapy because these things can change during the course of the disease. IGHV mutational status does not change, so only needs to be done once. Um, and the major push for this um, program is to avoid giving patients chemotherapy if they have um, TB53 abnormalities. And really, I think we shouldn't be giving chemotherapy to any patients who with IGHV unmutated disease, probably also those with IGHV mutated disease either. So let's uh, change our focus a little bit. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, safety of the BTK inhibitors and what the implications of BTK inhibitor selectivity are for the safety of these drugs. Um, so here you can see the kinase profiles of the three FDA-approved agents, ibrutinib, calibrutinib, and xanabrutinib. Um, in these diagrams, each of the um, dots there indicate a specific kinase. Red dots indicate kinases that are being inhibited, and the larger the dot, the stronger the inhibition. So you can see just visually that ibrutinib is the least selective of these three BTK inhibitors. Acalibrutinib is the most selective. And the importance of that is that we think that some of the side effects that we see as kind of the BTK inhibitor side effects are not actually due to the inhibition of BTK itself, but rather due to off-target effects. These are um, you know, potentially due to inhibition of things like TAC, which can con cause bleeding and potentially cardiac toxicity, as well as inhibition of EGFR, which can cause things like rash, diarrhea, and arthralgias. So here's our spectrum of toxicities that we tend to see with BTK inhibitors. As you can see, a number of different systems can be involved. Um, we are concerned about cardiac toxicities, things like atrial fibrillation, hypertension, occasionally ventricular arrhythmias. Um, bleeding is a, a side effect of all the BTK inhibitors, as well as bruising. We can see arthralgias. We can see GI toxicity like diarrhea. And then we can see infections as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but basically all of the side effects are more common with ibrutinib than with the more selective second generation BTK inhibitors. Um, you know, because of the implication and association of BTK inhibitors with higher grade bleeding, we don't give any BTK inhibitors concomitantly with warfarin. They can be given with DOAX and with antiplatelet agents, but you really also do want to monitor those patients for toxicity. Um, hypertension can occur with any of the BTK inhibitors. Management is just, you know, as standard with hand antihypertensives. We don't have any data yet to say that one antihypertensive is better than the others. Um, you should always be monitoring for any symptoms of cardiac arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation. Usually those should prompt a change in BTK inhibitor unless there's some other reason for the atrial fibrillation. Um, a couple of things specific to the second generation inhibitor is acalabrutinib is associated with headaches. Um, these tend to be relatively mild and usually occur for only the first couple months of therapy, and they um, can usually be effectively managed with acetaminophen and or caffeine. Uh, Xanabrutinib, um, you know, a special toxicity, you, you do see a little bit higher rate of neutropenia with this agent. Um, you can use growth factor support if you need to. Uh, sometimes you do need to interrupt the doses. Usually you don't have to go down on the doses, though. One thing that's been really helpful in, um, in CLO therapy and kind of choosing among these inhibitors is that we do now have two head-to-head -head trials of covalent BTK inhibitors. We had the Elevate RR study, which compared acalabrutinib to ibrutinib, and then the Alpine study, which compares xanabrutinib to ibrutinib. So let's first talk about the Elevate RR study. So this was a non-inferiority study um, in terms of progression-free survival of acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib in patients with relapsed refractory high-risk CLL. And in this case, high risk was defined as the presence of either a 17P deletion or an 11 q deletion. So you can see here with the progression-free survival curves, acalabrutinib is in fact non-inferior to ibrutinib, and actually the median PFS of 38.4 months is the same between the two groups. Um, importantly though, we do see lower incidence of some of the key adverse events without acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. 
Um, we see lower grades grades of atrial fibrillation or flutter, which was a key secondary endpoint. This was seen in 16% of patients on ibrutinib versus 9.4% in patients on acalabrutinib. That rate with acalabrutinib is actually a little bit higher than most people were expecting given previous data. Um, and actually, when you look at patients who didn't have a history of atrial fibrillation, that number goes down to about 6 to 8%, which is more in line with what we usually expect with acalabrutinib. Hypertension was also significantly less common with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. All-grade bleeding, which was both bleeding and bruising, was also much lower with acalabrutinib than ibrutinib. High-grade bleeding was the same, though, between acalabrutinib and ibrutinib. Um, we did see a little bit more um, headaches, as mentioned previously, with acalabrutinib. Uh, diarrhea and arthralgia were also a little bit less likely with ibrutinib compared to I'm sorry, less likely with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. Diarrhea and arthralgia were both seen less commonly with acalabrutinib compared with ibrutinib. We also saw a lower rate of treatment discontinuation for patients on the acalabrutinib arm compared with the ibrutinib arm. Um, this is a retrospective study which was looking at time to treatment discontinuation for patients who were treated with either acalabrutinib or ibrutinib. Um, this was uh, a database looking at uh, over 2,500 patients with CLL, rel relatively short observation time of 16 months. Um, but you can see here in this kind of real-world setting that patients treated with acalabrutinib do indeed discontinue ibrutinib, I'm sorry, discontinue therapy at a lower rate than those patients treated with ibrutinib. So let's move to the Alpine study. Again, this is the head-to-head -head trial of xanabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. The study was set up a little bit different than the Elevate RR study. Um, this was a uh, study in all patients with relapse refractory disease, didn't have to have any particular risk categorization. Um, the primary endpoint was actually initially overall response rate and then progression-free survival, and both were looked at in first a non-inferiority and then a superiority manner. Um, after a median of almost 30 months, both overall response rate and progression-free survival were improved with xanabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. Um, so at 24 months, 79.5% of patients treated with xanabrutinib were progression-free and alive compared to 67.3% of patients treated with ibrutinib. Importantly, also, we did see lower rates of atrial fibrillation and a flutter with xanabrutinib as compared to ibrutinib. Hypertension actually was the same between the two. Um, similar to acalabrutinib, the rate of, ble of bruising was a little bit lower with xanabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. The rate of kind of all-grade hemorrhage as well as major bleeding was the same between the two. Kind of the conclusion from that is that when patients have cardiovascular risk factors, they should preferentially be treated with a second generation BTK inhibitor or in some cases a BCL2 inhibitor. Um, really for most patients, a second generation BTK inhibitor is going to be the treatment of choice. One other thing that we've seen with the second generation BTK inhibitors is that you actually can sequence them after another covalent inhibitor in patients with intolerance. Um, so this is a study of acalabrutinib in the setting of patients who had discontinued ibrutinib for intolerance. And we can see that most patients did not actually have a recurrence of the toxicity um, that they stopped ibrutinib for. For those patients who did experience the same toxicity, in almost all cases, it was a lower grade with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib suggesting that for a patient who has intolerance to ibrutinib, you can successfully switch to acalabrutinib. A similar study was undertaken with xanabrutinib. In this case, patients could have either been on ibrutinib or acalabrutinib first and then switched to xanabrutinib. Most of the patients on this study were actually on ibrutinib first. Um, very few were on acalabrutinib, but kind of the similar, the similar conclusions were reached as the prior study which is that most patients didn't have their same toxicity recur. When patients did have that same toxicity recur, in almost all cases, it was a lower grade, suggesting that patients who were initially treated with either ibrutinib or acalabrutinib could successfully be switched to xanabrutinib in the setting of intolerance. 
So we're going to switch gears again, and now we're going to talk a little bit about resistance to BTK inhibitors. So all of the three covalent inhibitors, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, have the same mechanism of action. So they all will bind covalently to BTK at the C481 site. Um, most of the resistance data so far comes from ibrutinib, again, just because that drug has been around longer. And from the ibrutinib data, we know that um, the most common reason that patients initially have a response to drug and then acquire resistance is because they will develop a mutation in BTK at the binding site of the drug. This is almost always a cysteine to serine mutation, which interrupts that ability for covalent binding. You can also see cysteine changes to other amino acids as well. What happens with the cysteine to serine conversion is that ibrutinib is changed from an irreversible inhibitor to a reversible inhibitor with decreased binding efficiency. Um, and because the half-life of all of these drugs is relatively short, if you have reversible inhibition, you're going to spend most of the day with BTK not bound. Um, in addition to mutations at BTK, you can also see mutations in the immediate and downstream target of BTK in the B-cell receptor signaling pathway, which is PLC gamma-2. Um, so patients can also develop mutations in PLC gamma-2. In this case, though BTK is still blocked, the B-cell receptor signaling is turned back on due to an activating mutation in this downstream um, uh, gene. You can also see rare resistance mutations that um, I think we're still working to characterize you know, how prevalent these are and how exactly they contribute to um, resistance in CLL. Here we see on the left uh, just a, a schematic um, based upon our initial experience at Ohio State looking at patients who were discontinuing therapy, discontinuing ibrutinib therapy and why they were doing so. Um, so you can see about 25% of patients were discontinuing due to events other than progression. So many times this was adverse events or just patient or physician um, decision. Um, one of the you know, important points to make here, though, is when we think about progression, we think about two different things. We think about progression of CLL, and then we think about Richter's transformation. Especially in the relapse setting, Richter's transformation tends to occur early. So within the first couple of years of treatment, most patients are not going to progress with CLL. So if you see somebody who gets started on MPTK inhibitor and progresses within the first couple of years, first thought should be Richter's transformation. After two to three years, CLL progression becomes much more common. And as mentioned, uh, overcount on the right, as an experience um, uh, from the Data Farber group, um, again, kind of mirroring what I mentioned before, BTK mutations are the most common mechanism of acquired resistance. A smaller number of patients will have PLC gamma 2 mutations, and then some patients will actually have both of those, and some will have uh, neither of those identified. And again, there's still a lot of work being done to try to figure out why those patients do progress. Um, as mentioned, those mutations can happen with any of the BTK inhibitor, the covalent BTK inhibitors, and will actually confer resistance to all three. So a patient who becomes resistant to ibrutinib cannot be switched successfully to acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. Same thing with any of the other drugs. Um, and as mentioned as well, you know, we have less data in resistance with acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. However, the data we have uh, thus far does suggest that those C4081 mutations are common with all three of those inhibitors. Here we have some data from the Elevate RR study where we looked at resistance mechanisms to ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. Um, we did find that um, the pure BTK mutations were a little bit more common in patients treated with acalabrutinib, um, whereas we saw more patients on ibrutinib develop PLC gamma 2 mutations. Um, and as well, I think there are still some mutations that were trying to figure out what they mean with with these type of um, drugs, including the gatekeeper mutations, uh, T474I, an E41V mutation, and then the L528W mutation that was seen in one patient with ibrutinib. Um, with cyanobrutinib, um, there's even less experience so far. Um, this was a small study out of Australia where they looked at 24 patients who developed resistance to ibrutinib. Um, 
and all of those patients had developed C481 mutations. They also looked at 13 patients who developed resistance on xanabrutinib, and they thought, again, the majority of those patients had developed a C481 mutation. Um, however, seven of those patients had also developed an L528W mutation, um, which we'll talk about in a minute is why that's important with that drug. So when thinking about these mutations, you know, they're very helpful to understand the mechanisms of a resistance, but how should they be used clinically? Um, testing for BTK and, and or plc gamma 2 mutations can be helpful to confirm resistance to the BTK inhibitors. So I think that these are especially helpful in patients where you think that they might be progressing, like maybe their weight count is going up a little bit, they don't have lymphadenopathy, they don't have any systemic symptoms, and you're trying to decide whether they actually are progressing on the drug versus just having another redistribution lymphocytosis or, you know, have an infection or something else like that. I think BTK inhibitor, BTK resistance testing can be very helpful in that setting. Um, and as well, you know, when you're thinking about how to sequence patients, I think, you know, as time goes along, we're going to use these tests more and more frequently. Um, PLC gamma 2 mutation uh, status can be helpful as well when you're kind of trying to decide if you want to pursue a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, currently, neither a mutation in BTK or plc 2 by itself is an indication to change therapy in the absence of any signs of disease progression, though. So let's think about a case. So this is a 75-year-old patient named Carl who has CLL. Um, underwent two years of watch and wait, did not have prognostic testing done at baseline, um, and now is rise stage three, has lymphadenopathy, has splenomegaly, um, has anemia, and has um, has fatigue as well. Comorbidities, um, he does have diabetes, which is well controlled, though on insulin, has hypertension, which is managed with antihypertensives, and is currently a performance status of one or two, and that's all due to his CLL symptoms. So what additional tests should be done to establish or confirm prognosis? Um, if they haven't already been done, and I mentioned in this case they haven't, this patient should be tested for IGHV mutational status. They should be tested, you had fish testing done a karyotype done, and NGS for at least TP53 mutation. Um, one thing I want to mention is, you know, especially if you're going to be doing these prognostic tests at baseline, it can be really helpful to look at this in the context of the CLL IPI or the CLL International Prognostic Index. Um, there is an online calculator available for this. Um, so this calculator or this uh, formula takes into account a number of variables, age, clinical stage, TP53 status, IGHV status, and beta-2 microglobulin. If you have all that information, um, uh, patients will be stratified anywhere from low to very high risk. Um, right now, the CLL IPI is best, again, for those patients who are newly diagnosed and kind of understanding time to first treatment. Um, it hasn't yet been validated in the setting of novel therapy treatment. So it's really hard, you know, if you're going to start somebody on a novel therapy, it's hard to use the CLI IPI to understand how well they're going to do going forward. Um, but again, very helpful if you're going to do these tests at baseline. Okay, so we get Carl's test back. He is IGHV unmutated. Um, his fish shows both a trisomy 12 and a deletion 17P. And his next generation sequencing shows a, a TP53 mutation. Um, this has a 75% variant allelic frequency because of the loss of the other um, TP53 allele. So in this case, the best treatment for Carl would be a BTK inhibitor. And we're probably going to use the second generation BTK inhibitor in this setting. So, you know, a few things to think about first. How can shared decision-making help clarify treatment decisions and help patient understand BTK inhibitor safety? So again, we're going to, based on our knowledge, we're going to use a second-generation inhibitor, less likely to have cardiac toxicity, less likely to have some of those not dangerous but annoying toxicities like the arthralgias and the GI toxicities. Um, really helpful to involve pharmacy at this point to make sure that none of the um, concomitant medications are going to interfere. Really helpful to involve nursing. Um, as well to think about some of the side effect management. 
always when I'm starting somebody on CLL therapy, you know, one of the things I think about is how would I treat this patient if they progress? And and we're going to spend some time talking about this in a little bit, but if, you know, if he progresses on, let's say we choose a caliburnum in this setting, again, we can't switch to either iburnum or xanaburnum if he progresses. So we could consider switching to xanaburnum if he was intolerant. Um, but we're going to think about other options for treatment at progression. And then any of it is to suggest testing for BTK inhibitor resistance after progression. And again, I would say that that can be very helpful to understand whether a patient has a BTK or a PLC gamma 2 mutation at the time of progression. Um, at progression, we'd want to be sure we also repeat FISH testing and karyotyping and NGS, both for the BTK and PLC gamma 2 mutations, but for TB53 mutation in somebody who didn't have it already. Um, so I want to point out another uh, resource from the CLL Society, which is the Patient Education Toolkit. This has a lot of information about the biology of the disease, available treatment options, um, and just some other important topics like uh, some supportive care topics that are presented in a really patient-friendly way. Let's move on to our next section, examining efficacy of non-covalent BTK inhibitors and preparing for sequential therapy. So as mentioned before, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib are all covalent or irreversible BTK inhibitors. And we now have two um, agents in clinical trials for CLL, nemtabrutinib and pirtabrutinib, which are both non-covalent BTK inhibitors. So they are reversible inhibitors that will bind BTK at a site distinct from that C4A1 site. So in the presence of a C4A1 mutation, they're expected to still have equivalent efficacy. Um, Pirtabrutinib, as mentioned, is currently approved in mantle cell lymphoma and is in phase three studies in CLL. Nemtabrutinib also has um, quite robust data in CLL and is moving into phase three trials. So um, previously, we had talked about the selectivity of acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib being more selective than ibrutinib. Uh, our non-covalent inhibitors actually are two very opposite sides of the spectrum. So here we're looking at the kinase selectivity of nemtabrutinib and pirtabrutinib. Nemtabrutinib is actually quite a bit less selective than ibrutinib. It is a pan-tac and pan sark kinase inhibitor. Pirtabrutinib is quite a bit more selective. Pirtabrutinib is actually the most selective of the uh, clinically available BTK inhibitors. It's even more selective than acalabrutinib. Um, Pirtabrunib, uh, therefore, is expected to have less of those off-target side effects. Nemtabrutinib, though, is less selective, does have a little bit of a different spectrum of um, drug targets than ibrutinib does, so it actually has some different side effects, um, so it's something that doesn't share with ibrutinib. So here's just a schematic for you um, as to how these uh, drugs would work in the setting of BTK inhibitor resistance. So on the left here, we have we show how ibrutinib fits into that binding pocket in BTK, and you can see that covalent bond to C481. Pirtabrutinib on the right does not interact with that C41 site. So even if C41 is mutated, pirtabrutinib is going to be able to bind in just the same as if it uh, were binding to wild type BTK. Um, the data that we have thus far from per, uh, for pirtabrutinib comes from the Bruin study, which is a very, very large phase one, two trial um, of pirtabrutinib in patients with CLL and SLL, as well as some other um, uh, hematologic malignancies. Um, the overall response rate for pirtabrutinib in patients who had a prior BTK inhibitor is 82% and is acting just about the same in those patients who had both a BTK inhibitor and a BCL2 inhibitor. You can see in this waterfall plot here, almost all patients will have some degree of clinical response to pirtabrutinib. Um, the, this drug showed uh, pretty similar efficacy, actually, in those patients, again, who were double refractory, as well as those patients who had also received chemotherapy and or a PI3 kinase inhibitor. Um, median progression-free survival is 19.6 months. Um, so actually, unfortunately, it is not a drug that is likely going to be able to be used for most patients for many years after a covalent BTK inhibitor. 
um, but certainly is a drug that is effective in this setting and can be used while you're kind of continuing to think about further down the line options. One thing that uh, is actually very remarkable about, about, about this drug is the very low incidence of side effects. And again, that's because this is such a selective BTK inhibitor. So we see very few patients discontinue due to toxicity. And most of the toxicities that are seen are grades one or in some cases grades two. And even those adverse events of special interest, like things that we expect to see with BTK inhibitors, bruising is uncommon, rash, arthralgias, uh, hemorrhage, hypertension, all extremely uncommon. AFib is almost non-existent, which is especially, um, I think, relevant here because all of these patients were previously treated with another BTK inhibitor and in most cases with ibrutinib. Um, Nemtabrutinib, again, is the other non-covalent BTK inhibitor that is in later stage clinical trials right now. Um, the data we have thus far comes mostly from the Bellwave 001 study. Um, so this was a, a dose escalation and then expansion study. Uh, now we look at the data in two cohorts, so patients with C41S mutations and those without those mutations. Overall response rate overall is a little bit over 50%. Um, and again, the same for patients with C41S. And the response rate actually was pretty much the same for all of our prognostic factors, including those patients with 17P elation. Um, outcomes, this data is far less mature than the peer to brutinib data. Median PFS, though, for all CLL patients is about 26 months, um, median of 57, 15.7 months for those patients with C41S mutations. So fairly similar efficacy we expect to peer to brutinib just waiting for, for more data to be available with this agent. Um, again, this is a less selective BTK inhibitor, uh, but kind of a different spectrum of targets than ibrutinib has. So um, many of the side effects that we tend to see with BTK inhibitors, we don't necessarily see at the same rates um, with nemtabrutinib. Those things like arthralgias, hypertension, and rash, they can occur, but not a very... Um, uh, not a high grade and not a high frequency. Atrial fibrillation was seen in 4% of patients. So, you know, now that we have kind of accumulated data on the efficacy of pirtobrutinib, we also know a little bit about resistance mechanisms to pirtobrutinib. Um, we don't know anything yet about resistance mechanisms to nemtobrutinib or to any of the other um, non-covalent inhibitors that are in clinical development right now. Um, importantly, though, with pirtobrutinib, we do see a, a fairly diverse spectrum of resistance mutations, but mostly centered around BTK. Um, the ones that are kind of the most common frequency thus far are the gatekeeper mutations, T474 um, site mutations, and then interestingly, um, what we call kinase dead mutations, things like L528W and um, what that means is that um, the BTK with that mutation is expected to be non-functional. Interestingly, though, even in those cases, we see that the B-cell receptor pathway below or downstream of BTK is kind of turned back on, which is why those patients um, phenotypically will develop resistance. Um, this is an interesting uh, figure here on the right where you can see the prediction of whether um, different uh, drugs are going to be effective in the setting of these resistance mutations. Um, and interestingly, it looks like ibrutinib may have some efficacy even in the setting of some of these resistance mutations. As well, nemtabrutinib also is going to be effective with some of these resistance mutations. Um, so, you know, the question of whether you could then sequence a covalent inhibitor after pirtobrutinib is still open. Likely those patients would develop resistance fairly quickly, but I think that's something that, uh, you know, people are certainly interested in testing. And then um, whether or how you can sequence nemtobrutinib and pirtobrutinib, I think, remains to be seen. Um, there were definitely patients on the pirtobrutinib study who had previously been treated with nemtobrutinib and responded. Uh, little is known about sequencing in the opposite direction, although that, of course, will be interesting to look at in the future. Um, and another thing important to think about with pirtobrutinib is because of its selectivity towards BTK, it probably is going to have a little bit less efficacy in patients with PLC gamma 2 mutations. 
Um, and in fact, when they were looking at patients who progressed on pirtabrutinib, a number of those patients actually had pre-existing PLCA M2 mutation. So just want to highlight a couple of ongoing studies of the non-covalent BTK inhibitors in CLL. Um, there are a number of ongoing studies of pirtobrutinib. Um, there is pirtobrutinib versus idolisib plus rituximab or bendamustine plus rituximab in patients with relapsed CLL. There's also a study um, pirtobrutinib plus venetoclaxin rituximab compared with venetoclaxin rituximab and also a pirtobrutinib versus ibrutinib study that are all ongoing right now. Um, with nemtabrutinib, I um, want to highlight the Bellwave 008 study, um, which is nemtabrutinib versus investigator's choice of FCR or BR. Again, looking for a primary endpoint of progression for survival. So certainly these are some interesting options to think about for your patients um, if you're thinking about how to sequence after a covalent PTK inhibitor. So just some um, Caveats with when we're preparing for the use of these non-covalent BTK inhibitors more widely in CLL. Um, Pirtobrutinib, like I mentioned, FDA approved Amandocel lymphoma can be obtained off-label in CLL. Very favorable safety profile. Durability of remission is relatively short. So I would caution against putting somebody on pirtobrutinib and expecting that they're going to be on it for three years. So really thinking about what you're going to do next when you're, when you're planning that treatment strategy. <clears throat> Nemtabrutinib also appears to be a very active drug. Where that's going to fit in in the sequence, I think, is still a little bit unclear, but hopefully some of the phase three studies will really help to answer those questions. In addition to the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, for patients who had not been previously treated with venetoclax, venetoclax is an active approach um, after a covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, the, this trial was for patients previously treated with ibrutinib. Almost all patients were actually ibrutinib refractory. Um, and overall response rate to venetoclax, and again, this was venetoclax given as a single agent continuously, overall response rate was 70%, um, 61% in the patients who had TP53 alterations. Um, and the median PFS here is about 24 months. So again, not a very durable treatment strategy, but a, a, another very active approach after a covalent BTK inhibitor. So let's go to another case. So this is Margaret. She's 73 years old, has unmutated IGHV, was treated with acalabrutinib for three years, and now has uh, clinical signs of progression. In other comorbid conditions, she does have renal dysfunction with a very low creatinine clearance, has hypertension, which is well controlled, and has a very good performance status. You do mutation testing at baseline. She does not have a TP53 mutation, but she does have a BTK C41S mutation. Let's think about what are our options for this patient at this time, um, and then do the patient's options shift if they were previously treated with venetoclax. So thinking about the first one here, um, if the acalabrutinib was the frontline therapy, certainly either a venetoclax-based approach or a non-covalent BTK inhibitor would be an appropriate treatment. The clinical trial I mentioned for venetoclax was venetoclax given continuously as a single agent, although I, I think Almost everybody would agree if you can get a CD20 antibody in addition to the venetoclax, that would be preferable. And based on the CLL13 data in the frontline setting, obinutuzumab would be our preferred CD20 antibody for the combination. Um, so again, venetoclax-based strategy with an antibody would be very appropriate. Um, a clinical trial with pirtobrutinib and nemtobrutinib would be very appropriate. You know, if she was not a candidate for a clinical trial, and them to, I'm sorry, peer to brood, never given off label, can be considered as well. Um, if the patient had previously been treated with venetoclax, I think we would expect that venetoclax wouldn't be the best option for her. And maybe then we should be steering more towards a non covalent BTK inhibitor. <laughs> And so what if we did our mutation testing and in addition to a BTK mutation, there was a PLC gamma 2 mutation? Um, again, you could certainly consider venetoclax. We know that venetoclax is a very effective option in this setting. Um, you know, on the clinical trial of pirtobrutinib and CLL, there was some suggestion that response durations might be shorter for patients with PLC gamma 2 mutations. Still, definitely could be considered as an option. 
Um, but in the presence of a PLC given two mutation, I might expect a little bit longer remission duration with venetoclax rather than pirtovirtinib. Nemtovirtinib, importantly, actually does have efficacy in patients with PLC given two mutations. Um, because of because of the non-selectivity of this agent, it actually um, also hits MAP kinase, which is in downstream of PLC gamma two. So even with a PLC gamma two mutation, you expect the nemtabrutinib would still be effective. And so a clinical trial of nemtabrutinib can be considered for this patient too. Um, so again, back to you know thinking about resources for our patients. Really, when you're counseling on patients on their sequence options, consider mentioning the CLL Society as an available resource, just again for those toolkits to give some more information on side effects and other things that um, can be really helpful for patients, you know, especially if, you know, when we're thinking about shared decision making and having the patients um, uh, assist in making these treatment sequence decisions. So that concludes our um, didactic portion. I want to just leave you with a few take-home conclusions. Um, first, you know, the evidence is available to show the efficacy of covalent BTK inhibitors as a frontline treatment option in CLL, um, especially for those patients with very high-risk disease, like a TP53 abnormalities. These are probably our most effective frontline option. We always want to be thinking about how we're going to sequence our available agents for our patients. And if you're using a covalent BTK inhibitor first, both venetoclax and non-covalent BTK inhibitors are effective in the post-covalent BTK inhibitor setting. Um, current studies that are ongoing as well as future studies are going to really help us understand how to best sequence these drugs. Right now, there is not data to suggest that for most patients, you need to use these drugs in a particular sequence. So you could use covalent BTK inhibitor, venetoclax, non-covalent BTK inhibitor, covalent BTK inhibitor, non-covalent BTK inhibitor, venetoclax, or even venetoclax prior to the BTK inhibitors. Right now, we don't have a lot of data to suggest that one of those options is the best, but hopefully we will know more about that in the future. So that concludes our exploration of sequential therapy and the role of prognostic assessment and precision medicine in the treatment planning for patients with CLL, especially when treatment with a BTK inhibitor. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash UTY 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Merck & Company, Incorporated.